Christ is risen. Friends, welcome to First Churches on this day when we celebrate the resurrection, the most unbelievably beautiful of all miracles. Please know now more than ever that whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, be you a believer, a questioner, or a questioning believer, you are welcome here. We are glad you are here, and it will be a joy to celebrate this day together. I am so happy to see this church full of people, but I would be remiss if I did not let you in on a little secret. And that is that Easter here in the church is not just a day, it is a season. It lasts for 50 days in the liturgical year and it will run over the next seven Sundays. So if you really want to feel the import of the meaning of the mystery of resurrection and reconciliation, you might wanna come back next Sunday maybe the Sunday after that or the Sunday after that, to see not just how these mysteries shape the early Christian community, but how they have the power to shape us, that we might be an Easter people, a people of resurrection, a people who can shape our community for the better. And I say this not to make anybody feel guilty or obligated, but because I sincerely believe that what our world needs right now is people of peace. So I'm so happy you are here and I hope to see you again in the future. A quick reminder that all of the children will remain with us during the service and Rachel has activity bags. There's some still up here to keep kids busy. Kids might be running around. They might make some noise. That's great. Let them. It's fine. All right. Um, all right. Okay. So we're going to do this now. All right. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> Everybody find your center. I'm so excited. All right. Find your center and let us open our hearts to experience the wonder and the mystery of this most holy day, for Christ is risen. You're going to have to do that a few times in the service. Just try it one more time to see you're right. Christ is risen. You're going to be awesome. <laughs>
friends, would you please rise for our call to worship? After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Friends, our opening hymn is 118, The Day of Resurrection. Dear ones, hear the good news. 
Christ is risen. Nothing, neither sin nor circumstance, no, not even death, can separate us from the love of God made known to us through Christ Jesus. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ. Now, my friends, let us bring our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings to God. Nothing back when it comes to loving us. 
Help us to hold nothing back as we seek to love you in all we say and do. Take these gifts we offer and use both them and us that we might bring healing and hope to this world you lived and died and rose again to save. Amen. As you're being seated, you may be seated. Um, I'm going to invite the children's choir to come forward to sing for us before we hear the scriptures this morning. And this is wonderful. Um, every child you can see and hear in our sanctuary this morning, whether they're up here singing or not, is a sign of resurrection. One of the things that went away during COVID were our kids. And so to see them coming back is a sign of God's resurrecting power. They are symbols of that. And I, I love them so much. And I'm so happy they are here. So thank God for these kids. Where's Lily? Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. Paging Lily. Thank you. And now let us hear the word of God. Our scripture today is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, 
Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of them to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is a bit awkward. Here we are all dressed up in our Easter finery. I've got on my Easter super suit. We've decked out the sanctuary with tulips and lilies. We've proclaimed he is risen. Thank you. We filled the cross with flowers. The bells have rung. The choir has sung. We even hired a trumpet player, so you know we are not messing around. <laughs> Thank you, Dara. <laughs> but now that you've heard this morning's scripture, I'm afraid you also know that the guest of honor is nowhere to be found. If you've come here today to see Jesus in all his resurrected glory, well, I regret to inform you that he is not here. Not this year, because this year we are reading from the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus is conspicuously absent from his telling of the Easter story. Bit of a letdown, if you ask me. In Matthew, Jesus appears to the women as they flee the tomb, and then meets up with the disciples back in Galilee, where he commissions them to go and make disciples of all nations. That'll preach. In Luke, it's even better. Jesus appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He breaks bread, he eats fish, and he explains everything, everything, before he ascends into heaven. At least he explains everything to his disciples. It would have been nice if they wrote some of that down, but what are you going to do? And in John, the wordiest gospel of them all, we have Jesus' beautiful exchange with Mary Magdalene in the garden, we get not one, but two appearances in the upper room, and we get a bonus breakfast on the beach with Peter and the beloved disciple. The Gospel of John is like the Lord of the Rings. It just goes on and on and on, and it's awesome because you don't want the story to end. All of which is to say that Matthew, Luke, and John give us a satisfying ending. We get what English teachers call narrative resolution. If someone were to make Matthew, Luke, or John into a movie, you could comfortably roll credits at the end of any one of them. But not Mark. Forget the credits. It's almost as if someone pulled the plug before the show was even over. In fact, if you open your Bibles, just kidding, I know nobody brought their Bibles. <laughs> but if you did, you'd see that the early Christians were so dissatisfied with the ending of Mark that they wrote not one, but two additional endings. And let me tell you, even the ending you have before you has been tidied up in translation. In the Greek manuscript, the very last word of the gospel is actually gar, meaning for. As in, they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid for, for what? We'll never know. Mark ends his gospel with a preposition, and I can tell you right now, English teachers don't like that either. In Mark, all we get is an empty tomb. In Mark, Jesus is not with us in the end, but ahead of us. And that, my friends, 
is a different kind of story. When it comes to the Gospel of Mark, you have to work a little harder if you want the good news. When it comes to the Gospel of Mark, you have to work a little harder if you want to see Jesus. Because according to this gospel, if you want to see Jesus, then you have to follow Jesus. Follow him all the way back to where? Where has he gone according to the young man in white? Back to Galilee, yes. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, hold on to that. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he said. Well, all right then, back to Galilee. I can see how that was good news for the women, the disciples, and Peter, because they could actually walk there. But it seems a little less good for people like you and me right now, unless, unless this non-ending is actually a clue, a sign, an invitation, if you will, to look again. Here are two things you might not know. One, the Gospel of Mark is the only Gospel that begins in Galilee. And two, Mark was Jewish, as Jewish as Jesus. Sometimes we forget that here in the church, and because we forget that, we miss things that would have been obvious to his initial audience. I mean, I didn't even know this before I began work on this sermon, but I learned just this week that in Judaism, each congregation reads through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, over the course of every year. On the eve of the Torah celebration, Simchat Torah, they take the scrolls out of the ark and read through the night such that very early in the morning, that's an echo, when the night is giving way today, the last verses of Deuteronomy that describe the death of Moses are read, after which they immediately, Mark's favorite word in this gospel, rewind the scroll and start the liturgical year all over again by reading Genesis 1, ch chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mark's first words are also about a beginning, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Friends, I don't think it is just the women, the disciples, and Peter who are being sent back to Galilee. I think Mark is sending us back to, all the way back to the beginning of his gospel. All the way back to chapter one, where John the Baptist washed people clean in the River Jordan. All the way back to the place where Jesus launched his ministry with the words, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, repent and believe in the good news. Every disciple who failed Jesus, which last I checked was all of them, and Peter, who, let's be honest, no doubt felt he had failed Jesus most of all. Every disciple is invited back to Galilee, meaning that every last one of us, no matter how spectacularly we have failed in our efforts to follow Jesus, is invited back to forever for always. Friends, Mark's non-ending effectively puts the good news on repeat. Mark's non-ending invites us into an infinite loop of amazing grace. Mark's non-ending reminds us over and over again that no matter, matter how badly we fail God, God will never fail us. If all the disciples and Peter are welcome back after all they did and failed to do, then we are too. Mark is the gospel of new beginnings and infinite tries. Mark lets us know that we can always start over. We can repent and begin again and again and again, which means that you and me, we can change. It means that we don't have to live the way we've been living one moment longer if the way we've been living is hurting us or anyone else. We don't have to remain a prisoner to our past or in lockstep with the systems of oppression that dominate our present. The good news is that we can change and the even better news is that if we can change, then so can the world. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. If we can change, so 
can the world? I want you to let that sink in because that is not all. That is not all because you see, once you accept Jesus' invitation to start changing, changing yourself and changing the world, a curious thing starts to happen. You start to see Jesus just as he said. See him everywhere you go. Going back to Galilee doesn't just mean we can begin again with a clean slate. It means we can always re-up our call to follow Jesus. We can always recommit to following him, following him to the margins where we can minister to the least and the lost, the hurting and the hungry, those in need of healing and those in need of liberation, just as he did. When we do, we find Jesus in those we serve, even as we become Jesus to those we serve. People see Christ in us, even as we serve the Christ in them. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ within us, Christ all around us. We find that Jesus has gone ahead of us, not to do it for us, but to show us the way it ought to be done. He hasn't gone ahead to lock up our salvation, make, make a deal with God on our behalf so we can go to heaven, but to show us how to live into the joy of our salvation right here, right now, by loving one another as he has loved us. And finally, if we must pay for following him, pay as dearly as he did, he shows us that ultimately we have nothing to fear because the worst thing, the worst thing is not the last thing. Jesus went first to show us that nothing, not even death, nothing can separate us from the love of God. The worst the world can do to us is nothing compared to the last thing God will do for us because ultimately it is life that gets the last word in this story, not death. Love that gets the last word in this story, not hate. Grace that gets the last word, not vengeance or violence. Because the God who began the story gets the last word. And God loves every last one of us, even Peter, too much to let us go. There's a meme that's been circulating this week with the words of Dean Johnson, who writes, Jesus didn't die so that you don't have to. Jesus died so that you would know how to. Jesus didn't die instead of you. Jesus died ahead of you. Jesus didn't rise so that you don't have to. Jesus rose so that you would be able to. Death and resurrection isn't about substitution. It is about participation. Substitution keeps people suspended in a state of spiritual adolescence. Participation liberates people to fully partake in the divine nature. Jesus said, follow me, because Jesus knew we could. Jesus knew we were capable. And Mark shows us the way. Mark shows us how to follow Jesus back to the very beginning. Follow him to the places of greatest need. Follow him no matter the risk, for the one who has gone ahead of us will be there for us on the other side, just as he said. Friends, we may have to work a little harder for it this year, but trust me when I say Mark's gospel is good news for us all. Mark's gospel is good news for anyone who wonders if Jesus really loves you. The answer is yes. Jesus loves all of us, even Peter. So much so that no matter how badly we screw things up, we can always, always, always begin again. Mark's gospel is good news for anyone who wonders where Jesus is right now in this world so full of pain and suffering. Jesus the Christ is right where it hurts, inviting us to come help, hold, and heal the world the way he did that we might become Christ to one another. And this gospel is good news. Good news for anyone who wonders what comes next. Good news for anyone who has ever lost someone they love. Good news for anyone who fears being lost themselves. Because when it, what comes next, my friends, is resurrection. What comes next is life. What comes next is love. Because what comes next is God. And because the author of our faith is also our perfecter, God is not someone we ever need fear. 
I'm starting to think this gospel with no ending may be the best gospel of all. For a gospel with no ending is a gospel of good news, of infinite grace. A gospel with no ending holds out hope not just for a new heaven, but a new earth, an earth we can help and hold and heal as we become Jesus for one another. Friends, a gospel with no ending may be the best gospel of all because it reminds us that the last word about us has yet to be spoken, and that word belongs to God and God alone. A God of new beginnings and forever tries. A God who loves us too much to ever give up on any of us. A God who has gone ahead of us to show us the way and is just waiting for us to catch up, waiting for us even now, just as he said. So let me hear you say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me hear you say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me hear you say hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah and amen. <laughs> the late Rachel Held Evans endeared herself to many of us by writing about faith with great humility. She was not afraid to express her doubts and in so doing made room for other doubters to draw near to God. Whenever she would preach, she would always begin by saying, on the days when I believe this. And I'd like to borrow that phrase for our prayer time this morning. Would you pray with me?
Dear Jesus, Holy One, on the days when we believe in it, your resurrection changes everything. On the days when we believe, your resurrection means that anything is possible. On the days when we believe, we know deep in our hearts that there is nothing to fear, that love, not hate, peace, not war, life, not death, will get the last word. And so on the days when we believe, we can range out into the world with boldness. We can dare greatly and risk our all. We can find a way where there seems no way, rise up on wings like eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not grow faint. We can bear all things, believe all things, endure all things, because we trust that your love will get the last word. We can trust that you will forgive us even when we fail, trust that you will catch us even when we fall. On the days when we believe, we know that no matter what, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. The trouble, God, is not our belief. It's our unbelief, our doubt, our fear. And so I ask that you would come to us in all your resurrected glory. Come to us and abide with us that we might know you and learn to follow in your way. For to follow you is to be led ever deeper into the mystery of your story. A story where we win even when we lose. A story where we offer up love even in the face of hate. Forgiveness even in the face of wrong. And sing our alleluias even as we make our way to the grave. A story where we press on, come what may, because we know deep down that love will win. It is a story as old as time. It is a story just barely begun. So be patient with us, we pray. Grant us grace to witness to your great love and your abounding mercy. Grant us faith that we might know you and make you known. And grant us courage that we might reflect your love to all the world. Hear our prayers for those we love. We pray especially for Kathy as she is mourning the loss of her father. For Peter and Jenny as they are mourning their beloved niece Hilda. For Desiree as she is mourning her cousin Mickey, for Rachel and her mom, for Sue, for the people of Gaza and Haiti and Ukraine. We pray for Manny and Isabel right now, for Connie, for Jeff, for Ruthie, for Dan and Sarah, John and Sue, Mary and her mother. Hear our prayers for those we love as we lift their names to you now. All glory be unto you, Jesus our Christ, risen now and forever, the one who taught us to pray, Abba, our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn is number 123, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
with the recessional plays, you are welcome to join us for the benediction on the front steps of the church. I invite you to follow the cross out.